Today we're going to start looking at some additional propeller systems. There's about four or five systems here that you'll see, not on every one, most of these tend to be on uh, larger aircraft, more complex aircraft. Uh, part of it is, you know, everything you add, every complexity you add increases weight. Every complexity you add increases maintenance cost uh, and has a potential to affect negatively or in some cases positively affect the reliability of the aircraft, right? The more complicated it is, the more there is to break. And so we've got uh, systems here that, you know, in smaller aircraft, you're not necessarily going to see all these because they're not uh, the weight and the additional complexity. You don't gain an advantage from it. But as you start to move into a little bit larger aircraft, and, and what I'm referring to here are uh, things like the King Air, um, things like basically light turbo, twin turbo props and larger. Occasionally you'll see them on a, a recip. There's a few on here that may may poke their head up on a larger twin recip aircraft. Uh, but again, not every airplane has every one of these. And, and some have some, some have other. They don't necessarily have all of them or some of them. So, so the first thing we're going to look at is something called an overspeed governor. And this is uh, very similar to the propeller governor that we already discussed. Okay, it works in a similar principle. Uh, but remember, the, the regular governor... And, and on most of these aircraft, these are a, a, a feathering, reversible, constant speed propeller. Uh, most of them are going to have counterweights. And what do the counterweights do? What are they going to do to the blade angle? They adjust the blade angle. Which direction? How do they adjust the blade angle? Smaller angle? So counterweights typically are going to take the blades to a higher angle of attack. They, remember, they're going to be there. They're going to oftentimes automatically help automatically feather the propeller in the event of engine failure. They're put 90 degrees to the blade. Okay. So most of these are going to be propellers that have, have counterweights, and thus oil pressure, in this case, is going to move the blades to the fine pitch position. Okay. So counterweights and, and sometimes springs are going to go to the coarse pitch or to the feather position and then oil is going to be used to drive the blades to the fine pitch. This is how the King Air operates for instance. So when you see the King Air, if you go out there and look at it, the blades right now are sitting in feather. Um, they will not go to fine pitch until you start the engine and get oil pressure building up. Um, and they're installed between the propeller governor and the propeller servo. And the propeller servo, and I'm talking about the propeller servo, that's the mechanism we discussed that's in the propeller that actually moves the blade position. That's the piston and the dome and the linkages and everything. Question or stretching? Okay. Uh, so you know, that, that's called the servo mechanism. That's another name for it. So I'll refer to it as servo mechanism just so you know. The mechanism that changes your blade angle. And so what happens is, is if for some reason there is a failure or, or for whatever reason the governor itself uh, doesn't maintain maximum prop speed or less, if, if the propeller RPM begins to exceed the max RPM and up to whatever percentage this is set at, you know, the, the overspeed governor is going to kick in at a certain percentage. Oftentimes 100 and, it might be 107%, 110% of rated speed, of rated max speed. Uh, it's going to bypass oil back to the sump, which will, so the oil will leave the propeller dome. It'll be allowed to leave the propeller dome, and that will, then that propeller will go to a coarser pitch position until it reaches the maximum, uh, the max RPM. It brings it back down from an overspeed to a max RPM situation. And it works in a similar manner. So. Woodward, you've probably seen this name before, uh, is a manufacturer of these. Here's the schematic of it on the right. You can see in it, um, it has flyweights and speeder springs and all the same things you see in a standard governor. Let me make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Uh, so it has a very similar build to a, uh, to a, a normal prop propeller governor, uh, but it doesn't control the speed except if that speed exceeds the max RPM for that propeller and that, that, that output shaft, output speed. So under normal operation, which is what's shown here, 
the um, flyweight are held, you know, in, right? They're pushed in by that speeder spring on the little tabs at the bottom. You know, and right now this is showing this either on or at a lower speed position, right? So it's kind of an underspeed, but there is no such thing with a with a with a overspeed governor. There is no such thing as underspeed. If it's an underspeed, if the propeller is less than the speed that this is looking for, it basically doesn't do anything. It doesn't, it doesn't provide any additional control. Okay, it's not that it doesn't do anything, it just doesn't control anything. And so when the engine's running and those flyweights start to spin at, you know, they will maintain, they will not reach that overspeed position until the propeller reaches an actual overspeed condition, until it gets to that. Depend, again, depends on the propeller and the manufacturer and the engine. It may be 104%, 107%, 110%. It's usually somewhere in that range. And if for some reason the propeller gets going that fast and those flyweights get moving, uh, then it's going to kick in. But if we're in normal operation, anything less than that overspeed condition, the speeder springs, or the, the speeder springs hold the flyweights in, and the flyweights basically... You know, just like in a, a regular prop governor, they're going to control a pilot valve here. Okay, that can port oil, but instead of porting oil to the propeller, it would port oil back to the sump of the engine. And right now it's showing cutoff. So here's your propeller governor. That's the oil pressure to or from the propeller. The propeller's down here at the bottom. You can see this is hooked same line where if essentially the pressure from the prop governor is getting high, it has the ability to, instead of that oil coming from the prop governor, always propeller, it can bypass it and go back to the engine sump. So under normal condition, it's closed. It's not bypassing any oil. And so the propeller controller, the propeller control governor, the main governor, is going to control, it's going to control the prop speed and the, the propeller blade pitch, the blade angle. This is a backup system. This is a, this is a system that, again, it's a, if, you know, if our propeller governor fails and doesn't work correctly, we don't want the propeller to fly apart, right? Centrifugal force is the highest, the greatest force we have on a propeller. And centrifugal force goes up goes up very, very quickly once you get you know, into those higher RPM ranges. There's a lot of centrifugal force on these things. So if we start to overspeed, if we get going too fast, you have the potential for the blade root areas or the bearing tracks down there on the blade, you know, down in the, in the root to fail and have the blades detach from the hub or have the hub itself crack and allow the blades to come out. In the event of an overspeed, what happens is now our flyweights, and I don't, I don't have a drawing, I've only got the one picture, but in the event of an overspeed, the flyweights would overcome that speeder spring, just like in an overspeed in a regular governor, but instead of cutting off the supply of oil to the, um, to the propeller, it's going to relieve the pressure from the oil being supplied to the propeller. So the flyweights would, would come out, Right, they'd go into that overspeed condition. They would lift the and that oil that's being the propeller would instead be allowed in this this area from the pilot plunger would come up and it would allow oil to flow back down into the stump in the engine and essentially reduce the amount of pressure in here. But it's only going to reduce it to the point that the prop gets back to its normal max operating speed, right? As that prop comes back to normal, these flyweights will come back in, that'll close, and that oil will be allowed to continue to go. So it will, it will not, it won't feather the propeller, it won't put the propeller to fine, it'll just bring it back to its normal max operating RPM, okay? So the propeller will go to that higher pitch, lower RPM setting, And because of the centrifugal twisting force, 
So the, the oil will be cut, will, the oil pressure to the dome will be reduced. And then the centrifugal force acting on those flyweights will push the blades to that higher angle of attack, which will put more drag on the propeller and slow it back down and to bring it back to its speed that it's supposed to be at. And some might also use a spring force for that too. You may have a spring that takes it to, you know, so it's going to take it to the higher angle of attack, but it's not going to take it all the way to feather. There are times, though, where we need to test this. These have a test device often built into them. And so, well, let me go back here. There's something I wanted to point out. Now I can't remember what it was. OK, not that important, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Got to love that when you're, um, when you're doing, when you're using one of these, one of the maintenance practices we commonly have to do is to perform a test of these systems. And we're not going to test it. We never want to test it by trying to overspeed the prop. First of all, the, the main propeller governor shouldn't allow that to happen in the first place because this is a backup device. But they have kind of an ingenious system to be able to do this. Unlike you know, the main governor, we have the ability to adjust the tension on the speeder springs using our prop control lever, right? And so we do this, we test this using the same kind of a situation but we use hydraulic pressure in order to adjust the tension on the speeder spring. So, and that's what this solenoid operated shutoff valve over here on the right is used for. This is part of the overspeed governor test. So to test the operation of one of these, we activate the test switch. And what that does is it opens this needle valve. <clears throat> it ports a little bit of pressure up here, which pushes up on this, what they call reset on this piston. And that's going to reduce the amount of pressure on the speeder springs. You know, it's kind of like bringing the prop lever back, you know, going to a slower speed. So that will allow those fly weights to kick out at a lower RPM. So now we can, now what we'll basically do is recalibrate this thing using that valve to kick in in the normal operating range rather than four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent above the normal operating range. And so we set our propeller somewhere in the normal operating range, usually near the upper end of it, and then we activate the switch that opens this valve, and we make sure we watch to see if our prop RPM drops, and it does it the exact same way. So the reset piston up here is pushed up, it's reduced the force on the speeder springs. The speeder springs swing out. When they swing out, trying to do, it opens the pilot valve, reduces the pressure coming from the prop governor to the propeller itself. And then that causes the blades to go to a higher blade angle and slows down the propeller. So we should see a drop, and usually it's anywhere from about three to ten percent of the of the range, right? So something like the King Air, max prop speed on it. I used to know this off the top of my head. Twenty seven fifty? Does that sound right? Anyone ever operated at max prop speed? That sounds a little high. But you know, if if it was we'll say twenty seven hundred uh, RPM, you know, if it was twenty seven hundred RPM and it's supposed to drop uh, 10%, it should drop, you know, 270 RPM, so about 24, 30 or so. And usually there's a range. It'll give you a range up and down, you know, plus or minus 50 RPM, something along those lines. Uh, and so it basically operates, it does its thing in that lower range. Now, what ends up happening, though, is then you close the valve, you turn the, you release the tech switch, you close it, pressure is no longer on there. This, you know, it, the pressure in here drops. When you, and so it'll drop, and then it'll actually, the pressure in here will drop along with it. Uh, so it'll kind of drop and come back up again. Right, then it'll think, that'll cause those speeder, those, those uh, flyweights to come back in, so now it'll allow it to speed up a little bit. So you get a drop, and then it comes back up. It's kind of a funky thing. And so when you release that solenoid, 
it closes, you don't have a bunch of extra pressure in there still. Um, it acts kind of like a check valve as well. This, if there's pressure in here, it can push back. You know, this is spring loaded down, but it can overcome that a little bit and, and allow the fluid to pour it back. So it doesn't stay locked in that position. Usually these are a spring loaded test switch. You push and hold it, and if you let go of the switch, it snaps back into place. You don't want this thing being left on all the time, and then all of a sudden you can't get uh, full RPM, right? The pilots are probably not going to be very happy about that. Uh, what you will get, though, is if one of these goes bad or gets stuck in the open position, you will get pilots writing up that they're not able to achieve max RPM. And this can be one culprit of that if a system starts to have a problem or say the wiring gets shorted that runs this or something along those lines. Okay. So there's a few other items shown on here. I like this diagram because it actually has several of our other uh, items that we've talked about. I briefly mentioned unfeathering pumps earlier. And so, you know, these propellers are designed, if you lose oil pressure going to the prop, right, because where does the oil pressure come from, ultimately? It comes from the engine, right? If the engine shuts down, we want the propeller to go to feather. Okay, so those fly weights, while the prop's still spinning, and probably some spring force as well, when you lose that oil pressure, it's going to want to go fully to feather. Uh, so, on this, there, this shows an unfeathering pump. Okay. So, if it goes to feather, on an engine like uh, our TPE uh, 331, that's our fixed shaft turboprop down in the lab, we cannot start that engine if, it's in a, if the propeller's in a feathered position. There will be too much resistance on it. The core of the engine will not be able to spin up fast enough, get enough airflow, and it'll over temp during the start process. Okay. So if for some reason it shuts down, goes to feather, they have to do an emergency shutdown, or sometimes some of the maintenance actions we do, we shut it down without going through the full shutdown procedure, where we lock it. There's, there's pins on that that lock it into the fine pitch position during a normal shutdown because it'll automatically want to go feather if those don't engage. Uh, if we need to get it back to feather, or sorry, get it back to fine pitch, we can use an unfeathering pump. So like the King Air wouldn't have one of these. It doesn't have this. There's no reason to need to drive those blades back. That is a fit, that's a free power turbine. Remember, a free power turbine, there's no physical connection between the propeller and the gas generator core of the engine. Right? You have a compressor combustion section, a turbine, and that creates combustion gases that go through a free power turbine, which isn't attached to any of that and is only driving the propeller. But the TP331 uh, and other similar fixed shaft engines, you have the compressor, the combustion chamber, the turbine, maybe a second turbine, and that directly drives the prop. That's where that direct drive or fixed shaft turbo prop comes from. And those can't be unfeathered during startup. So they'll, in, they'll incorporate one of these unfeathering pumps and they call it an unfeathering adapter plate, but all it is, essentially, is a check valve. There's a little ball in here, under normal operation, pressure in this manifold will be on the top side of the ball. It won't be able to push down. There'll be oil in here, but it won't be under pressure or anything. So it really doesn't do anything when the engine's not running, but if the engine's if when the engine is running, excuse me, if the engine's not running and we need a source of pressure to move that propeller from feather or high pitch back to fine pitch prior to starting the engine, you typically have a pump that's going to run. It can run off a battery, off a DC. If your aircraft's an AC aircraft, most of these turboprops are DC aircraft to begin with. Most of them use a starter generator, 24 volt. But um, it will, oil from the pump will be supplied under pressure from down here, it's now able to pass through this check valve because there would be no pressure in here when the engine shut down. The overspeed governor would be in this position because it's not running. Right? And that would be able to port pressure down and into the prop servo, into the dome to move it to fine pitch. And it'll rotate the blades out of the feathered position back towards a low angle of attack. There are some reciprocating engine aircraft that would have this as well, but they're fairly few and far between. Reciprocating aircraft aren't as sensitive to starting with a prop in the feather position as a fixed shaft turboprop. 
So you'll primarily find these on thick shift turboprops. Another item we have here is an auto feathering valve. And that's shown on the far right. You can see it's another needle valve that looks very similar to the, the valve we used for testing, um, for testing uh, the overspeed governor. Uh, but in this case, this one does not control, you know, the overspeed governor test that place anytime it's working, it's going to modulate, it's going to modulate to keep the prop at that max RPM. Doesn't want to go over, but it's going to keep it from going under. And so what we have is an auto feathering valve. Now, this is in addition, this is yet another kind of backup system on the aircraft. Right? What's the normal, if we have an engine failure on a twin, if there's an engine that shuts down, how, what's the normal way the prop feathers? The weights, because of a loss of oil pressure, cause that engine to feather. But will that be an instantaneous process in a turbine engine? No, turbine engines take a while, to, unless the engine seizes. Turbine engines rarely seize, by the way. They, they were made. They will go send parts flying out the exhaust everywhere. But it's rare that they like seize solid right away. They tend to spin down and there's a lot of inertia there. I mean, they're spinning really fast, right, inside. And so rather than waiting for it to spin down, if we wanna make sure that prop goes to feather like that, they'll incorporate one of these auto feathering valves. Okay, and then it's a bit of a misnomer. They call it an auto feathering, but often they can be controlled manually as well. So automatic or manual activ activation is a result of engine failure. Automatic triggered by a loss of engine oil pressure and or RPM. If all of a sudden the RPM starts to drop too much, or more importantly, if the oil pressure drops really quick, um, or they can monitor all kinds of other functions on there, especially newer engines that, are, um, that have like a FADEC control or an electronic control. Right, that's looking, can look at hundreds, if not thousands of engine parameters in some cases. You know, it can, it knows when something's wrong and it has to shut it down right away uh, or stop the prop. So it can even, some of them could even potentially be because of things like vibration and that kind of thing. So automatic triggered by loss of engine oil, RPM, oil pressure, uh, or any number of things. Manual, there can be a switch in the cockpit. Now it's typically gonna be guarded. Um, and if it's activated, we don't want to only activate this. We need to also make sure the engine is continuing to try to drive this thing in feather. So it will, it will also trigger the engine into a shutdown situation if it hasn't already. Uh, but that pressure in here, remember that pressure in this manifold that goes to the propeller is moving those blades to that fine pitch position. So essentially all it does is needle valve pulls up and dumps all that pressure straight back to the sump. So this one isn't going to modulate. You know, the, the, the overspeed governor, that will send oil back to the sump, but only enough to bring the prop speed back down to where it should be. In this case, it's going to dump all the pressure altogether. And when it dumps that pressure, then that prop is instantly going to, not instantly, but very, very quickly, uh, going to want to go to that feathered position because of the centrifugal force acting on the counterweights and the springs pushing inside the, inside the servo dome. Prop goes to feather, there's the reasons why, but it dumps all pressure. So that's the big difference, is an auto feathering valve is gonna dump all pressure versus the overspeed governor is just gonna, just gonna pour it off enough to slow the prop back down to where it should be. And so you can see that's kind of a, a secondary system or a backup to the oil pressure it's just kind of dropping away as the engine shuts down. So that's another one of our kind of auxiliary systems that we'll see on bigger turboprops. With many aircraft, with most twin or four engine aircraft, multi-engine aircraft, we want to have the, abil the ability to synchronize the propellers. I can't remember, is anyone in here a pilot fly? Anyone fly the Seminoles? Anyone ever hear the Seminoles out here doing run-ups? None of you have heard the Seminoles out here doing run-ups? No? 
They run up while we're there all the time. Anyone ever hear the Seminoles out here doing roundups going wah, 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 wah? That means the propellers are out of sync. You get really weird harmonics. It can be uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for the passengers. It's very loud. Someone's over here laughing. Is that? Oh, I thought you were laughing at my noises I'm making. Sorry. Didn't need, you don't laugh? <laughs> oh, I thought I saw like kind of a, a chuckle that going on. Like, like, <laughs> Jeff's, Jeff's a dummy. He sits there and goes, makes wah wah noises up front. <laughs> you can laugh at me. You're welcome to. I didn't mean to call you out. You. So I apologize if I put you on the spot there. You're welcome to laugh at me. That's part of why I'm here. So feel free. Um, so synchronizing, so we don't want to make the wah-wah noise. We don't want to have a lot of really bad vibrations. I'm not going to even start singing that one. Uh, I guess good vibrations, right? Good, vi yeah, see, that's, yeah, bad, bad joke. Uh, and the props that are out of sync, if they're serious and out of sync, they can, it's not just noise. I mean, they create a lot of noise in the airplane. They can create a lot of noise on the ground. Uh, but they can be, it can be to the point it can actually make you sick if you're in the airplane. Because those vibrations aren't just sound, they're also physically traveling through the aircraft. So if you ever are flying on a turboprop and you have one that won't sync out where they, they don't sync it very well, um, you can actually get like a queasy feeling from it. So again, these are, add some complexity to the aircraft. They add, this can be done manually, the, 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 the crew can manually do this by, you know, kind of tweaking their their prop levers, right? One engine's a little fast, one engine's a little slow. You can kind of you can kind of dial them in. Some aircraft have like a little indicator. It spins one direction if the left one's fast. It spins the other direction if the right one's fast. Um, it's a little like black and white wheel usually, and kind of spit. You can see it spinning, and then as you get them, in, it'll be spinning fast when they're really out of sync, and then. As they get closer and closer to sync, it spins slower and slower, and then it, once it kind of stops, then your props are in sync with each other. Uh, but what we want to do is match this up to reduce that noise and vibration. And in this case, one engine's designated the reference or master engine. Um, the other engine is designated as the adjusted or the slave engine. I, the, new, the newer terms you'll hear, most newer manuals are going to call them reference and adjusted. If you see older ones, you may see it referred to as master and slave, okay? So the reference and the adjusted engine, um, but what you're gonna have is some kind of, and it's, it's, these are almost always electronic. There's a, there's a few different ways to do it, but they're, they're typically an electronic device. They're gonna have some kind of a speed sensor on them. And I'm gonna go back, because I actually realized, I, I totally forgot there was a speed sensor shown here. So you can see right here, magnetic synchronizer pickup assembly. And it's screwed right into, it can be in the overspeed governor, it can be screwed into the governor, um, it can be in other, there's other areas it can potentially be. But you can see there's a, like a little disc down here that's part of the flyweight, and that's gonna have a target on it, or it's gonna have one spot with like a tooth on it. And every time it passes by that magnetic pickup, it sends a pulse, right? There's a little magnet that sends a pulse. And that pulse is picked up by the synchrophaser. So it can look at the pulses coming from the left engine, and it can look at the pulses coming from the right engine, and it can compare them. And so the RPM then, it'll have a method, it'll, it'll look at those speeds, and it will adjust the engine that's the, the adjusted or the slave engine, will be stepped to match the reference engine. It'll, it'll bring it up, you know, say, say the, the, the adjusted engine is slow, the adjusted propeller, it's more the propeller than the engine itself, but propeller RPM is slow, I should change that. It'll bring it up a little bit and give it a second to stabilize. Because when you, when you make an adjustment on a, <clears throat> on a turbine engine, it's a turboprop, you get something called hysteresis. You move the lever and it takes a second for everything to react and for it to stabilize at that new speed. You make an adjustment, it takes a second to, to get, you know, stabilize at a new speed. And it's true of turbo fans, turbo props, whatever, because there's so much rotating mass there and so many things moving that there can be some delay. So it'll adjust the propeller RPM to match the other engine 
Um, so it'll bring it up a little bit. So say our right engine's a little bit, our, our adjusted engine's a little bit slow, the um, reference engine's a little bit faster, it'll bring that adjusted engine up a little bit, up a little bit, up a little bit. There's kind of a timer delay until they match up. Or it can consequently do the opposite. If the reference engine is, is a little bit slower than the adjusted engine, it will bring the adjusted engine slower, a little bit slower, a little bit slower to bring them back. But it can't do this across the entire range. They typically are within a, a limited range. So it's up to the, the operator. Uh, you know, for maintenance, you're often we would have to go out and test these things, make sure they were functioning, that they would capture correctly. Uh, where you have to adjust the proper others to get them, maybe get them within 50 RPM of one another, or maybe you have to get them within 75 RPM of one another. And then you, then you engage the, synchroniza the synchronizer, the synchronization system, and it has to capture and then it will make an adjustment to bring those together. Okay. Um, if a lever is moved out of that range, it'll drop offline. You know, it won't, it can't, you know, say you start bringing that, that reference engine down without touching the, the adjusted engine, it will only be able to bring it down a little bit and then once they get too big of a split, they can't do it. And the reason for that is the, the adjustment for this lives in the prop control linkage assembly. So you have prop levers in the, in the cockpit, right? And the, the reference engine, that prop control lever goes directly, you know, through cables or pulleys or push-pull rods or all, you know, what kind of linkages, is hooked to the governor directly, the propeller governor, on that engine. The, the adjusted engine have the same cables, push pulleys, everything else, but before it gets to the, um, the prop governor, before it attaches to the prop governor, there's a little linear actuator there that can make itself longer and shorter. And so that's what does that little bit of adjustment. It still is adjusting the prop governor to make them, to bring them in, but it essentially is, instead of your lever directly attached to the prop governor, your lever is attached to a little thing that can adjust its length that's then attached to the prop governor. So when we go out and look at the airplanes, I can show you that the King Air's got one. I can show you what it looks like on one side or the other. We'll do a, like I said, we'll do a tour and looking at where we're at today, we may go do a tour on Thursday. Maybe, we'll see. Um, but, so it's going, so that's why that range is limited because that little, that little actuator, that little linear actuator can only move so far. I had this picture, this shows an actual um, overspeed, or a prop, this is a prop governor. You can see it's got the arm at the top to be able to adjust. And here's what one of those pickups looks like in real life. Okay. And the magnetic pickup and the target, they can be in several places. We can, they can be on the propeller governor, they can be on the overspeed governor, like was shown in that other picture I had. They can also be on the propeller and backing plate itself. So, the propeller that's got the, you know, the, the backing plate that has like the slip rings for the, for the anti-ice on it or the slinger plate on it, the slinger ring, they'll have a little magnet essentially screwed into one point on that. And then there'll be one of these little magnetic pickups sitting nearby. So every time that passes by, it pulses the magnetic pickup. Okay, so they can be internal, they can be external. The Saab 340s I worked on had one of these attached to, it was on a little bracket by the spinner, or by the backing plate. And then the spinner backing plate, they had the slip rings on it for anti-ice, that had the target on it. We always knew when our engine mounts were getting worn out. Any idea why? What happens when engine mounts wear out? Vibration, the engine starts to vibrate more. What happens when you have a target that's the little thing on the backing plate that's vibrating up and down, swings past a magnetic pickup. And it may not pick up all the time. It usually picked up up until the point something else happened. What do you, what do you think would happen? The pickup was about that far from the target. They'd crash. So we'd get a complaint that the prop um, gov or the, the, yeah, that the, um, we'd get a complaint that the synchronizing system wasn't working. And we go out to the airplane, we pull the cowl open, and we would see either the magnet was missing, sometimes they'd just fall out, 
or the tip of this thing was basically broken off. And then people would replace those and call it a day. And it would happen again and again. Because what they really needed to do to fix the problem was replace the worn out engine mounts that had gotten soft. The engine mounts, they're rubber, and over time that vibration actually softens the rubber so then the, air, so then the engine can vibrate more or move around more. And the, the bracket that held the little thing was, was mounted to the aircraft structure, the nacelle structure. So moving engine, stationary, boom, it knocked it, it hit up. Uh, but one of the things you have to do is set the gap on these. When you work on them, there is, they have to have a gap you know, a certain distance, and it's, I'm trying to remember, I want to, want to say it was about 60,000. I think we could use a pair, a set of 40 to 60,000. We could use like a big piece of safety wire to actually set the gap. It's like a feeler gauge. And so pretty easy to do when you've got a spinner, backing plate, it's got a target, you can adjust it. It's got a little lock, a little set uh, bolt or set nut on there, right? You see a little knot. So the, the sensor threads in. And then this is a lock nut on the back side of it that, that holds it in place. So you can screw it in or screw it out. On something like this, what you often have to do is screw it all the way in. You back that, you back that lock nut off as far as it'll go. You screw the sensor in. Well, first, you, before you put the sensor in at all, you look inside and you make sure the target is lined up with the hole, Okay, the pickup target. And then you screw the sensor all the way in until it touches that target, till you feel it touch the target. And then they'll tell you to back it out like one turn and then set your lock nut. So there are ways that, you know, you got to look at the procedure. It'll tell you how to do it. But it will, so here's that, that thing. I had it circled. It'll control that. Um, and so what it does is it's ultimately, all it is is controlling that prop that prop lever input to the adjusted engine, it's just controlling its input to the propeller governor and telling it, yep, speed the prop up a little bit, slow the prop down a little bit until it matches the reference engine. A little more high tech and a slightly more impressive version of this is something called a synchrophaser. And so this is very similar in function and purpose. The, the function and purpose are, are pretty much, sorry, the purpose is the same. We want to reduce vibration. But we can reduce vibration even more, not only have propellers uh, in the same, synced up, turning at the same RPM, but we can also look at their positions relative to one another as well. Okay? And typically the way that is, is you want the tips, the propeller blade tips passing the fuselage. You know, they're turning and pointing towards the fuselage. You want those turning and pointing towards the fuselage at the same time. So you get those shock waves from the left and the right hitting the fuselage, and they're coming from opposite directions. They essentially will cancel each other out. You, know, you get one shock wave traveling this way, one shock wave traveling that way, and they cancel each other out. If your blades are going like this, you can get that kind of shockwave, 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 shockwave. You get that kind of back and forth noise too, even if they're turning the same speed. So by phasing them, we keep the blades turning so the blade tips are passing the fuselage at the same time. And their shockwaves help to cancel one another out. So position becomes important, not just um, synchronization. And so it works similar. That, that pickup now, instead of just looking at speed, that pickup's in a certain position on the blade or that certain position on the, um, on the governor, you know, on the thing spinning inside the governor. Those are geared directly to the engine, right, or to the propeller. They're turning along with the propeller. It's important that the propeller orientation, you know, sometimes you got to make sure, and that's where, like, locating pins come in, where you install the propeller, you want to make sure it's in the same orientation. Right? Even a two-bladed propeller or like a three-bladed propeller, you want to make sure they're, if they have a synchrophasing system, all that orientation becomes very critical because the engine has to know that the, not just how fast they're turning, but where that target is in relation to where the blades are in their rotational path. And so the position of the target on the slip ring or on the backing plate, if it's the backing plate, has to be the same. The positions in the governors are the same. 
And now it can look at not only how fast are they turning, but am I getting those, those magnetic pulses at the same time? And so it will monitor that. And, and so what happens here is um, the blade positions are kept at the state, you know, at opposite. I, I say at an angle, but, but you know, they're kind of like opposite angle. You got a three bladed propeller, one's up, one's pointed this way, one's pointed this way. You want the right one kind of, you want them coming together at the fuselage at the same time. Because normally they're, they're uh, or if they're or if they both are rotating the same direction, you want kind of the opposite blade hitting. It's kind of a weird path that they take. But yeah, this one's kind of coming down and up at the same time. It's doing, there we go. Can I do that? Can you do that? <laughs> Pat your head, rub your belly. Pat head, rub, forget it. Um, and so it'll monitor that. And so what happens is it works the same way. It'll still do the. You still have a reference engine, uh, you still have an adjusted engine, uh, but it may have to not just uh, tweak that, that speed up and down on that adjusted engine to get them to match up there and sync. It may actually down for a second and then speed it back up to get it back into phase. So it's, it's monitoring that too. So it's a more complicated process for it to bring them into, uh, into synchro phase. Um, but it's all done automatically. You turn the system on, you make sure it comes on. Uh, the testing it, you can, from the cockpit, you can see if the, the RPMs are equal, if the synchronization is working. Verifying that the phasing is working is a little more complex process. Part of it can be sound-based. You can tell if they're not phasing. You get that, the different vibration noises. Uh, but there's also systems you can put on the airplane, uh, vibration analyzers, and there's these there's things used for doing like prop vibration control where late you put a reflector on one of the blades and then shoot a laser at it and so it knows when that blade's a certain position and so it's kind of I, I always thought they were fun tasks to do to go out you got to use some kind of neat equipment you got to go out and run the heck out of the airplane um, but each airplane kind of has its own way of, of doing that um, but you use the test equipment the one, when you get out in industry, the big company that makes that equipment is Viper. Uh, you'll see the Viper 2 boxes, although the, maybe they're getting phased out and something new has come out, but those were always kind of the most common out there. We'll come back later. <laughs> I'm done.